welcome to the Tropical Theatre for this afternoon's presentation that is called Understanding Russian. Well, let me introduce myself uh, first. My name is Icy. Well, my full name is Isolu Sadrislanova. Probably guessing my uh, origin. I'm from Russia. Now, I've uh, prepared this my own per personal presentation that is called Understanding Russian, where I'll be talking about the uh, Russian history, Russian culture, in the meaning understanding Russian history, Russian culture, and the way Russians are in general. And uh, this is my personal presentation where Russia is, and it's divided into uh, different regions, and there's 22 different republics that are pretty much like states. Um, they are independent in a way, every single uh, republic has their own um, president that reports to the president of the Russian Federation. Sorry. Or a couple of people. So uh, uh, here I'm showing the beautiful version of Kamastrak because uh, it's actually quite famous for participating in the Dakar rally, showing and with the colors. Now the yellow color shows the Slavic ethnic groups. Now Slavic uh, includes Russians, uh, Ukrainians, Belarusians. We also have, uh, if you take a look at the uh, pink color, like really bright pink, this is Iranian Alan. Um, ethnic groups. It's close to Caucasus, uh, the uh, the um, mountain Caucasus. We also have uh, Jewish ethnic groups, Caucasian. We've got Finno Burik, which is orange color. It's a riddle, right? In a mystery, inside an enigma. And I actually quite agree with him because uh, Russians do puzzle me sometimes, and they're very different in a way that uh, they're not really smiling. They don't smile too much. I think I'm the only smiley representative of the <laughs> Russians. Um, but I think it's because I went to high school in the U.S. I was 16 years old and I was an exchange student for a year. And actually I studied in uh, Preston High School for a year in West Virginia. Anybody from West Virginia? Alright, so that's in the Preston County and I lived in the city called Albright. Very small little city and uh, actually uh, lived in a host family. Very good family that we're still friends with. So uh, when Winston Churchill said these words, I, I uh, pretty much understand him because Russians um, a bit different in their behavior. I find it's so in, it's so easy to spot a Russian anywhere in the world. As for me, I'm, I'm well traveled and I can easily spot a Russian by the way they behave, by the way they talk, by, by the way they smile or they don't smile. So uh, it's very interesting, uh, the easy I'll be talking about the ancient Russia that uh, dates back to the 9th century, then I'll be talking about the Mongols, um, the Mongols invasion and the emergence of Moscow. I'll be touching bases on the Romanovs era, which is the Tsar's era, Soviet Union era, I'll be talking about the World War II, the Great Patriotic War, and the Russian Federation. Now, these are the topics that I found the most significant in the Russian <laughs> Europe. And the Scandinavian people at that time were called Varangians, and the leader of that tribe was called the Rurik. So they uh, went down uh, to the Eastern Europe, and they discovered this area. It wasn't actually called Russia. It was just a, a collection of different cities. And they found Kiev. Kiev was the center of that um, uh, Russia back in the days, and it was actually called Kievan Rus. So Rangin discovered the city center, and they really liked Kiev. They, they, they liked um, its location, and it was a flourishing big city, and they established a big trade between uh, Scandinavia and Constantinople, and it turned into a Kievan Rus. Uh, now that uh, this, this his man will not be able to survive without the hard liquor. And he switched to the Orthodox religion. <laughs> I, I, I think there's much more other reasons why they decided to go for Orthodox religion, but that's the time, the, the era when they actually established themselves as Orthodox religion at that time. Uh, the time comes, and then uh, the next era, and very significant era of Russian history comes, is Mongol invasion, Mongol Tatar invasion. So if you look at the map, this is the, tour, the territory of which Mongols uh, controlled. It's a big, uh, big uh, territory. They even 
went to some part of Europe as well. And of course, Kiev and Rus was captured. And if we talk about the Iron Curtain, that was the Iron Curtain. Because for 300 years, Russia was under uh, Mongol invasion, under Mongol Tatar invasion. There were heavily taxed. Uh, there was really heavy attacks as well. At that time, Kiev was completely destroyed. And uh, in that period of time, Moscow becomes the capital. But it's heavy. Uh, it was a very difficult time for Russia because the nation came to their land, that they had no idea who they were, they had no idea what language they spoke, they had no idea what religion they were following, it was just complete strangers that occupied their lands and they had to go by their rules. They were so the very, um, they became very different from the rest of the world. So Russia liber liberated th themselves, different era comes, it was uh, called Romanov's era, the Tsar's era. Russia liberated themselves and they opened their gates to the rest of the Europe and Europeans started to come to Russia. And they found Russians being so strange because they all looked European to them, they all looked the same, but in a way they had a very different mindset, very different behavior. So it was very strange for them seeing Russia in that way. History. He was uh, the one that opened the window to Europe. He started developing Russia economically, politically. He started traveling a lot to Europe, bringing the European culture to Russia. Of course, it was not uh, accepted by Russians so easily at the beginning, because uh, Peter the Great saw the change uh, rapid, and he wanted to change everybody at once, but it was difficult to deal with his own people. So he... Uh, uh, and uh, decided to change the whole political idea of Russia, the whole political growth, economic growth, into communism and socialism. Now, it's something that people all believed in, and it, they believed that it was the right thing to do. It was an interesting era, because my grandparents, my parents grew up in that era, and I always asked them, how was that to leave in that communism era? when pretty much there was no market economy, and they didn't have too many things in the stores and the supermarkets, they didn't have too much of a choice of the clothing, how did you live back then? And my parents and my grandparents say, that's all we knew, that's how we had the idea that the Soviet Union was the best country to live in. It was the best option for them, it was a great paradise to live in the Soviet Union countries. That's, they, they truly believed in this. And it was normal for them to stay in line for hours and more hours to get that piece of meat or bread. It was normal for them uh, to uh, get the jeans if they liked in the black market. So uh, whoever wanted a pair of jeans or gums, they could get it in the black market, but it was completely forbidden. People were still happy. In a way, my grandparents. So, all, uh, so for me, uh, it's hard to understand how did they live, having so much, uh, such a um, small choice of things to buy from the market, or just uh, having this censorship, not no freedom of speech in a way, because at that time, people could not really speak up their opinions so openly. But then it comes to the reali realization that Russian people, in a way, if we go back to the history, didn't really have too much freedom of speech. If we go back to the Mongol Tatar invasion, when they were heavily taxed and lived under a uh, Tatar Mongol invasion for 300 years, they didn't have freedom of speech, so they didn't know what it was. Then it comes down to the uh, peasants' area when the people served their own. Uh, masters, of course they didn't have too much freedom of speech, they were not used to it, and now the communism era comes, it was pretty much like a normal thing. Of course there's a couple of individuals that spoke up and they wanted to say their opinions, uh, they didn't necessarily end up in a nice way, but still, people, some people tried, but in general, many of the people were not used to this, they didn't feel the concept of freedom of speech as if we could compare some countries that had democracy for 300 or even more years. They knew what it was. But for Russians, it, it was a bit of adjustment at that It lasted for five years, but it was the most significant, I find, event in the Russian history. It stays so deeply in the heart of every Russian. The, um, the 20 million lives were lost during this war. Uh, people fought strongly. They didn't fight for Stalin, they didn't fight for Lenin. They just simply fought for their families. And uh, Russia celebrated on the 9th of May, 71 years since the Victory Day. And we still celebrate it in a, in a way that 
This is the best thing that happened to us, the victory day. This is the time when we liberated ourselves and there was no war under our sky. And uh, we have this big parade in Russia. And uh, now, uh, back in the days when we had more veterans from the war, they used to uh, come to the parade. Uh, but now, since there's not so much left of them, uh, people start bringing the portraits of their uncles, of their grandfathers, of their great-grandfathers and just going to this parade, just to recognizing um, how important and how thankful they are for their granddads and grandparents. I'm just showing a little video of a parade that we've had in my city on the 9th of May, and I happen to be there. And it just shows the, the whole street up to the, uh, to the end is filled with people carrying the portraits of their fathers, grandfathers. You can see there's military men um, pretty much just paying the respect to the people. Uh, it, it is a, such a difficult tragedy for every people uh, that lost their relatives, their fathers and grandfathers. It wasn't su successful, uh, my... so they caught him and they beat him. But the fourth time he escapes, he runs away, but he doesn't go back to his house. He doesn't go back to his home. He continues fighting in the forest with the partisans. And when he comes back from the war, uh, of course, when the war was over, Another heavy period of time comes in Russia is the Stalin's repression. Because Stalin uh, strongly believed that everybody who was in the concentration camp or who fought in the western uh, uh, part of Russia, in a way, in Europe, uh, was suspected of treason. So my grandfather served uh, in the prison for about a year and then he comes back, he has a family, he had eight children, and he dies of a heart attack at the age of about 50 years old. So um, another area uh, comes because even in a way Germany lost the war in the refrigerators of German people there was plenty of food the way of life in general was such a high, higher level than it was in Russia so people that were coming back from Germany realized that Soviet Union wasn't really the best place to be at that time <laughs> so Stalin was in a way afraid of those people that came back from Europe knowing how uh, good life could be in Europe. So there was a lot of repressions that many people went to uh, Siberia or they were punished or they were uh, serving in, in the prisons of Russia after the war. So it was a difficult time but after Stalin's death it seems like everybody started breathing normally. The <laughs> life uh, went back to normal and some people came to realization that the idea of communism and socialism wasn't really a good idea. So can you imagine people believing so strongly in this communism? They believed so strongly, it was almost like a religious belief for them. Realized that this idea was not really a good idea. In a way, this was, the ideas were crushed. Uh, it was a utopian idea in a way. So many people at that time realizing that the Soviet Union and communism was not really a good idea. It can never happen that everybody would be so equal. There will always be a change. There will always be censorship. There will always be now. Democracy is younger than myself. I was born in '89, and democracy was born in uh, 1991. So, if you ask me if I truly believe that a Russian Federation is a, uh, is a true democracy, I would say no. I find that uh, democracy should be born within people. It's, sim it's something that is born within people. Uh, and uh, it might take a couple of generations for Russian Federation to become a true democracy because it should be in the heart of every person. Right now, my parents grew up in communism. My great-grandparents grew up in communism. So they don't really know. They might have a slight idea what the democracy is, but they don't have it in their hearts. The president, Yeltsin, when he came to power, he was a communist in his heart. He liked the idea of democracy, probably. Maybe he read some books or he liked the idea. But in general, his heart belonged to communism era. He knew how it functioned better than he knew what democracy was. Even Vladimir Putin, the president nowadays, he grew up in the communism era. So he knows what it's like in communism, but he doesn't really know what it's like in democracy. So. It's something that is born within the generation. So I'm thinking if my child will become a president, I hope not, but if my children will become president one day, they will have it in their hearts. And 
the generation to come, maybe in 50 years, maybe in 100 years, they will start understanding what it really is. capital of uh, Russia. Uh, it's a very educational capital, it's very cultural uh, capital of Russia. Uh, it's only 314 years old, it's relatively new to compare it to Moscow, which is about more thousand years old. St. Petersburg is a growing city, uh, it was built by Peter the Great, he was the one that uh, liked the idea to have a port uh, in the Baltic seas, and he built uh, St. Petersburg. Beautiful city, the outskirts of St. Petersburg has a little bit of feeling of modern Russia and socialistic Russia. You will get to feel it when you drive into the city center, and the city center has the star feel, the feel of Romanovs. They have, uh, Peter the Great brought a lot of architects from around the world, from Europe, Italy, France, and uh, you see the architecture in St. Petersburg, the influence of those European architects in the center of St. Petersburg. It's a